couple people. And we are going to dive in. Um, so there's a lot to cover today, so we won't be breaking up into small groups. Um, I want to really take you through Matthew. And um, if we get to chapter one, we'll get to chapter one. Here's, here's the plan for what we're going to take on with Matthew. It's a big gospel. Um, so 28 chapters. And uh, we're going to be doing about two to three a week. And you can always find the chapter we're doing that week in the Sunday MailChimp. But just assume we're doing about two to three a week. It's real helpful to read it ahead of time. We will spend some time on select passages. Because of the scope of this, we can't hit every passage. So we'll be I'm going to be highlighting and lifting up um, key passages within those chapters. OK, OK, I want to talk briefly about what the New Testament is. Uh, if you've done Bible study, you have seen this before, but it is really important to remember. Um, the New Testament has 27 books, and it's going to tell the story of Jesus and the church that followed him. It is a human product of an ancient community. Um, within the United Church of Christ, we do not interpret the Bible um, literally, factually, or absolutely. We say we take the Bible seriously, not, Lydia, not literal. In Matthew, we are going to encounter a lot of metaphorical language, metaphorical language. And we'll talk about this a little more. It is not concerned with factual reporting. That is not its goal. Um, important to keep in mind with Matthew is the laws and the teachings that we're going to encounter there are relevant to, are not relevant to all times and places, but are the product of that ancient community and address their time and place something that a lot of folks struggle with with the Bible. Again, we're going to see a lot of metaphor in Matthew. And um, metaphorical language is not inferior to factual language. There can be deep truth and meaning found in metaphorical language. Metaphorical language is the language of parables. Parables is the language of Jesus. The intent is not to report an event. It is to create a story that calls us into meaning. And we've talked several times in this these classes about surplus of meaning, how words can hold multiple meanings, that words have the capability, and sacred scripture has the capability to hold multiple meanings, and not as the one as opposed to the other. Okay, this, oh, go ahead. Somebody have a question? I'm sorry, it's somebody on my end talking too loud. Oh, that's okay. Okay, this one's a real important one um, because um, Matthew is, as my um, um, dear friend, Dr. Erica Martin, um, likes to describe, she describes Matthew as the Jewiest Jew that ever Jewed. That's how, gonna, that's how she teaches Matthew. It's really, really important to remember. So um, the scriptures that the gospel writers have in front of them, the sacred scriptures that they are using, that Jesus is using, is the Hebrew Bible. It's the Torah. It's the writing of the prophets, right? That's their sacred scriptures. There's nothing else. So they grew up with the Hebrew Bible. They heard it preached as a child. They grew into it as an adult. It shaped their identities. It shaped their understanding of the world. It's the foundation upon which they will stand. And Matthew in particular, it is his source document. He is going to quote the Bible. He is going to misquote the Bible lots and lots of times. So Matthew is going to pull up his understanding of scriptures and use them throughout a lot. Okay, at the time Matthew writes his gospel, um, there were only about 7,500 Christians. This is a teeny tiny little sect when this is being written. And um, it's hard to know when we start calling them Christians and they're different from Judaism. Jesus and all of his followers thought they were doing something within Judaism. 
Paul thought that he was doing something within Judaism. There's no word Christianity anywhere in the New Testament. It doesn't exist. And the majority of Christians were still Jewish as late as the middle of the third century. Okay. So this is a really critical one. Anytime we do the New Testament study, we understand this gospel best when we see it within the world of first century Judaism shaped by the Hebrew Bible. It is a way of being Jewish. That was how it was written. And Matthew, you can add five giant exclamation points behind that. Okay. He's coming out of the Jewish tradition. Okay. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's a little copying going on. That's why they're called the Gnostic or the um the um these three gospels are frequently looped together. Um and in particular, Matthew really is gonna copy. He's gonna take 90% of Mark and just move it over. Okay. So this image stick with you as we go into this, okay? Okay, pre and post Easter, just as a refresher, who's the pre Easter Christ? That's the um, Jesus of history. He's a mystic and a healer and a teacher and a social prophet. And he stood really firmly in the traditions of the Jewish Bible. The post Easter Jesus is that understanding of Jesus after his death that becomes the Messiah and the Lord. That's who we meet in the Gospels. That's who we're going to meet in Matthew, the post-Easter Jesus, right? Okay, and this is a developing story. Um, so Jesus's followers came to a more in-depth understanding of him after he died than before he died. So the pre-Easter, the post-Easter. We're going to see elements that we learned and encountered in Mark that are further developed in Matthew and Luke. And both Matthew and Luke add elements to Mark's stories that address specific needs, questions, concerns for their community. So they build off Mark and then they diverge and they're gonna create unique gospels for their community. Um, so, and including, they're going to take some out. Uh, if they don't work for their community, they're going to take some out. So, um, let's dive into Matthew. Okay, what's what's unique about Matthew? Matthew is known as the teacher's gospel. And the reason why is because it really focuses on the teaching ministry of Jesus. There will still be healings. There will still be... Um, meals, there will still be the spiritual components, but they're much, the the real focus of Matthew's gospel is this teaching component. And um, so those of you that did Luke with me, you're going to see a minimization of the feeding ministry and all the meals. You're going to see a minimization of all the spiritual components, all the times he was going out to pray. This is about teaching. It's also known as the accountant's gospel because Matthew is really interested in a very accurate account of things, structure, content, organization. Um, and sometimes Matthew can be a little confusing. Uh, Matthew is going to include different points, different stories, two, three times. Um, so example, he's going to heal two blind men. So he's going to cast out demons in two men. He's going to sit on two donkeys as he comes in on Palm Sundays. Um, he's not a sloppy writer. He does this with very clear intention. We just often don't know why he did what he did. Okay, so we will encounter some head scratching with Matthew. Okay, here's generally how Matthew is going to flow. We're going to start with his genealogy. Uh, we're going to encounter the virgin birth, the magi, the baptism, the time in the wilderness, and then we're going to get into his ministry. So it's it's going to include all the points that we know about from Mark and Luke. He's going to call the disciples. There's preaching, there's teaching, there's healings, there's parables. Um, and um, 
What's unique about Matthew? There'll be a long instruction, long sections related to instructing the gospels. What's also unique to Matthew that we're going to encounter is this thing called the commission. Matthew's gospel ends different than any other gospel. And we're going to talk about why it does that. So, but there are long sections related to teaching about the gospels. And remember, this is the teacher's gospel. Okay. Okay. What do we know about Matthew? We do not know who he was. It's anonymous, like all the other gospels. Um, tradition has it that Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew wrote the gospel in Greek. He did not write in Hebrew or Aramaic. Um, it'll be very clear from the very first words of gospel of Matthew that he knows his scriptures very, very well. And there's some thought that he had actual formal training as a scribe. He was most certainly a Jew. Um, he was potentially a converted rabbi or a synagogue leader. The depth of his knowledge of the scriptures is so deep. Um, among all four of the Gospels, one of the things that's really unique is Matthew is he alone is adamant that the original ministry of Jesus was directed solely to Israel. He's going to do it in four different places. So this is not the wildly inclusive um, ecumenical Jesus that we saw in Luke. This is not that Jesus. This is Jesus with laser focus on getting this word and these teachings to the Jewish community. It's also probably written to people who lived in a more urban and prosperous setting than uh, Jesus and his original disciples. And um, some biblical scholars seem to think it was written in Antioch. That was a really important site of ancient Christianity. Um, and one of the things we'll talk about, it was um, rumored to be where Peter settled. So we're going to talk about how Peter is actually treated in Matthew. If it was written in Antioch, that would make a lot of sense. Okay, when was it written? It's the generation after Jesus's first disciples. This is not written by one of Jesus's disciples. They are all dead. This is a generation after that, if not a second generation. It is the first book of the New Testament, and that's why everybody assumes it's the first book written. It's not. It's not. It's a generation after the time of Jesus. It's written after Mark. It is written after the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 CE. Um, I want to show you the timeline here. So uh, Jesus dies somewhere between 20 and 30. Um We've got 1 Thessalonians, the earliest writing of Paul's letter happening about 20 years after that. The first gospel is Mark's, and it's written, written right around 70. And Matthew's is the second gospel. It's written about 10 years after Mark. Okay, so that's the timeline that we're looking at here. Hmm. Okay, what do we know about Matthew? We know that he took Mark and he has it right in front of him. So he's going to take 90% of Mark and move it over verbatim into, Matthew, into his gospel. Um, so we know that he is an unnamed author. He is a Jewish Christian. It's some Roman city, probably Antioch. Uh, and it happened after the time of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Best guess, biblical scholars think that Matthew, when he sits down to write, has the gospel of Mark, the sayings of Jesus, which are known as the Q source, and then some other oral or possibly written tradition about Jesus. And he used all of that to weave it together into a story that was written for a very specific audience at a very specific time and place. Okay. Um, we've covered a lot of this. He is a just the facts guy. 
He's going to work on organization. He doesn't really like how Mark organized his gospel, so he's going to clean that up. <laughs> he's going to clean up abbreviations. He's going to um, remove colloquial expressions. I think he thought Mark was a little too hokey, so he'll polish them up. It's a more educated Greek that he uses. He's also going to uh, basically proof text Mark and fix incorrect titles. So he does that for Herod. And the other thing that's really interesting about Matthew is he's going to remove the things in Mark where Mark is ex explaining Jewish customs. Because Matthew's community doesn't need that because they're Jewish. They don't need somebody explaining what a Jewish, what the Jewish customs are. So that Matthew will strike out. Hmm. Okay, here's some other really interesting things we're going to see. Character portrayal. Um, basically, Jesus is going to get a, a, um, a makeover. Like a PR team comes in on Matthew. This is not the Matthew. This is not the Jesus of Mark. Um, so gone from Matthew's gospel. And remember, Mark Matthew. Matthew is the next gospel that's written after Mark. Matthew is going to clean up Jesus's image. He is going to remove any questions that uh, imply a lack of knowledge on Je Jesus's part. And they are in Mark. He is going to um, remove all statements that imply a lack of ability or authority about Jesus. Gone. And they are in Mark. Uh, he's going to remove any references to Jesus exhibiting human emotions. And that's in Mark. Pity, anger, sadness, wonder, indignation, love, gone. Matthew's going to strip that out. And Matthew's going to remove any implication and indication that Jesus is a magician, which is also in Mark. So first thing Matthew does, he cleans up Jesus's image. He polishes it up. Next thing he's going to do is he's going to do the same thing to the disciples. In Mark, the disciples come off very bad, very bad, a um, little dense. They don't get it over and over again. Jesus is like knocking his head against the wall. In Matthew, Mark's or in Matthew, Matthew is going to change from no faith to little faith. So again, he's giving them a makeover. This um, theme of them being not understanding is changed to being slow to understanding. Um, this, um, um, that um, ambition, and we're going to come up against this story later on of who's the greatest, is, is um, credited to the mother of James and John, not to the disciples. So it's going to he's going to change who is going to be asking who's the greatest. Yeah. Um, there are um, the additions of the disciples worshiping Jesus. They will reference him as Lord or son of God. That is not in Mark. So this is all Matthew. He's going to add this on. Um, and in general, the disciples just come across much better than they do in Mark. They exhibit more potential for growth and leadership than they did in Mark. Okay, they are, they are the, that's the end of the, the PR. And from now, it's downhill. The religious leaders of Israel really come off bad in Matthew. It's, it's really horrendous what Matthew does to the religious leaders. Um, so in Mark, there's a scribe who Jesus praises. In Matthew, he's depicted as an opponent who put Jesus to the test. Um, gone in Matthew are any friendly religious leaders. There are none. Zero, zero friendly religious leaders. Overall, religious leaders are going to come off way worse in Matthew than they did in Mark. Um, the other thing that's unique about Mark is in the, all four Gospels, there are only two instances where Jesus talks about the church, and they're in Matthew. And in Matthew, Jesus says he's intending to build a church. And in Matthew, Jesus is going to offer how the church should make decisions and regulate its membership. 
So this is this is a very, very post Easter. It only occurs in Matthew. And remember, what is Matthew? It's a teaching document for the early church. OK, um, the 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 other thing that's kind of unique in Matthew is it's the gospel where there are most number of Peter stories um, occur, which makes sense. If the gospel is written in Antioch, which is where Peter lived. So um, Peter gets a lot more airtime in Matthew than he does in any other gospel. Okay, here's something else that you're going to hear this so much. You're going to get so sick about it. We're going to hear happen to fulfill what was written in the prophets. You will hear that so many times in Matthew. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, and Jesus is going to give five great speeches, right? And a lot of biblical scholars connect those five big speeches with the five books of the Torah. Um, because again, Matthew is the Jewiest Jew who ever Jewed, right? Okay, these are some things that you will not see anywhere else other than Matthew. They're completely unique to Matthew. The big ones we're going to see is on fulfilling the law. Um, some of the ones that are really going to come up is the pilot washing his hands, severe repercussions with that one. Um, and you'll see how many of these are about Peter that show up, right? So they're not anywhere else. They're just in Matthew. Wow. Okay. Key themes of the gospel. Um, big thing is God is present um, and God is present on earth and God is present in the church and God is present in the world. Big, big theme for Matthew. Another big theme for Matthew is the Christology, the understanding of Jesus as the post Easter Christ is radically progressed since Mark. So in Mark, we didn't see a, the emphasis on Jesus as the son of God, the son of man. We didn't hear that a lot. You will hear it a lot in Matthew. Um, Jesus will be called my son. Um, Matthew is going to expand on that concept with the virgin birth story. And um, we're going to see the, God, the um, disciples confessing Jesus to be the son of God. And at his execution, Jesus is going to claim they're doing it because he is the son of God. So we're moving up the rank of Christology. So Mark was low Christology. Matthew's moving up. Luke was moving up. And then we're going to get to John, which is like way up here. Okay. Okay, um, the role of, again, Jesus as a teacher and a rabbi is most prominent in, in Matthew, which makes sense because Matthew is the teaching gospel. Matthew is the teaching gospel. Take that away with you. Matthew is the teaching gospel, and Matthew is the Jewish Jew, whoever Jew. Those are the two biggest points as you walk into this gospel. There's five big teaching blocks, Sermon on the Mount, and then four others that we're going to encounter. Um, the really big, I'd say there actually is a third big point about Matthew, which is this gospel is really focused on teaching how God wants people to live. This is all about the ethics of God's kingdom. We're going to encounter that when we dive into the Sermon on the Mount. That is what, three, four chapters? There is nothing in the Sermon on the Mount that is about a belief. It is 100% about actions, right? It is not about what to believe. It is about what you should be doing. Okay. Um, and Matthew, he's going to interpret scriptures a lot, and he's going he's gonna to mess it up. So he is going to take quotes out of context. He's going to change words and he's going to make scripture fit his point. So he's going to play fast and loose with it. Um, okay. Um, let's talk about um, 
Matthew and, and head into some of the Jewish components. We know that at the time that Matthew's written, those of you who did that early Christianity course with me, there were a ton of controversies in the earlier church because this was a Jewish moment movement, right? Jesus is a Jewish prophet, teacher, um, movement leader, healer. And when he dies, that message scatters and is taken up by lots of iterant, iterant preachers, uh, people traveling around, starting churches. The movement doesn't die. But the movement in the early days is spreading fast and furiously and with no organized dogma. And what's happening is it's primarily in the early days occurring in the Jewish synagogues. But it's starting to branch out and we have people who are not Jewish coming to the table who are fascinated with this message. And it's going to create a ton of conflict over the first three centuries. This is really going to impact Matthew's gospel because Matthew has some of the worst hostility towards the religious leaders of Israel. Universally, there is not one religious leader that will come out looking good in Matthew's gospel. They're presented as opponents of Jesus, which is different than what we saw in Mark even, and even in Luke. There are no exceptions. They are all bad. He is going to describe them as evil, and he's going to identify them with Satan. He's never going to encourage the religious leaders to repentance. Instead, he's going to tell people to just leave them alone, stay away with them. He doesn't think they're a part of the kingdom of God. Um, and he doesn't think that they will escape being sentenced to hell. So Matthew has all the feelings about the religious leaders. Okay. And it's not uh, just the leaders. It's going to extend behind that. There are negative references to the synagogues, um, and, which are viewed positively in Mark. And um, several of Matthew's passages are going to really emphasize alienation and hostility between the synagogue and Jesus's disciples. All favorable references to the synagogues in Mark are gone. Okay, why does Matthew do this? It's really heartbreaking. The biggest um, theory on why Matthew does this is that he is writing in the midst of enormous tensions between Matthew's church and the synagogue down the street and all the tensions that came up after the description of the temple that Matthew's community is located in the midst of a Jewish community that thinks he's bonkers, that thinks he's got it wrong, and that he is isolated and um, cast out for his teachings and beliefs. So that's the, that's the predominant theory of why Matthew writes, he writes. Um, there are other theories, one, that it's meant to be read ironically, um, the other is that he's making a theological point and um, the religious leaders are the personification of all that is opposed to God. Most biblical scholars think it's theory one. It is the context, the environment with, in, in which Matthew's writing, which is why he is so anti-Jewish leader and anti-synagogue. Okay. Why does this matter? And this is the part that is absolutely horrific and heartbreaking. The language from Matthew has been used over the past 2,000 years, in particular, the passion narrative, to condone extreme violence against Jewish people. It is Matthew's gospel that is cited as why um, Jews need to be punished for killing Jesus. It started in the, medieval, in the Middle Ages with passion plays, which were enactments of Matthew's gospel. And what would happen is the passion plays would so inflame the crowds that they would then riot 
and head into the Jewish sectors of the villages and the towns and rape and burn and destroy the sacred scriptures and murder um, individuals, all screaming words from the gospel of Matthew, right? So this Matthew's gospel will be um, critical in the rise of anti-Semitism actions taken against Jews for centuries, leading up to Martin Luther and what he wrote in the 1500s, all the way up to the um, um, yep. rationale that Hitler is going to use in 1930 to create his final solution. It's the Gospel of Matthew. Again, a gospel written for a very specific people at a very specific time, dealing with very specific pain and tensions is going to be taken out of context and used in horrific ways for the next 2000 years. Okay, there is a lot to love about Matthew. There is. I have I have crossed over. Um, and primarily, <laughs> what I really love about Matthew is there's teachings on how to live as a follower of Christ. There really is some of the most beautiful teachings in there about how to live. It's an instruction manual on how to be a follower of Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Uh, let me stop sharing real quick. If I can find my little button. Okay, and just do a check-in. That was a lot of context on Matthew. So let me just stop there before we go into... The next chapter in the genealogy questions comments reactions on go ahead bernie two, two chronological questions one why does matthew precede mark in the listing of the bible why yeah. did they turn those two around i have no idea the bible is not in a chronological order period okay second question is who is timothy on your on your chart there was a timothy oh yeah, so Timothy is one of the epistle letters um, that is a, a very late letter written, I want to say like 1300s. There are some really late letters that barely made it in. And if you remember that class I taught on how we ended up with the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. So um, Paul's authentic letters were a given. The four gospels were a given. Everything else from that point on, other than Paul's authentic letters and the four gospels, was contentious um so revelations highly contentious only made it in because somebody in power wanted to basically um uh talk down to their enemy that's how that, and we'll talk about that in that class um the other pseudo paulian letters um barely made it in there is an enormous collection that did not make the cut um, but Timothy is one that made it in. It's back there with James and uh, First John. They're all about the same time. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Marilee. Well, the notes in my Bible said the order of the books in, in the New Testament is is primarily about how long they are. So Matthew's longer than Mark. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I mean, somebody figured out something. I mean, that doesn't make any sense, but that's... It doesn't make any sense, but it's a good answer. Right at the beginning. There you go. Okay. Other questions, thoughts, reaction to everything we've heard about Matthew? Well, you know, context is important. And so seeing all this about Matthew, I'm a little open to him because now I kind of understand him. And so, because I think I've mentioned, I think Matthew is quoted so much in the Catholic Church and those stories with absolutely no context. Right. And then taken completely as fact. Yeah, yeah. So it makes sense that Matthew would be heavily quoted in the Catholic Church because it is about an ethos, a way of living, right? It's mm -hmm. a teaching gospel. So that I get that. I get that. Why that might make sense. Um, it's a teaching. And that's what also kept most of the Catholic is based on is teaching. How to live, how to live a Christian way. Yeah. So. It's absolutely tragic how Matthew's gospel is interpreted. Um, so I'll again recommend um, 
from Constantine to Christian Constantine to Christianity. Oh my gosh, that's such a good book. Uh, if, oh, I'm not getting the name right. I recommend it every class. Uh, what is it from Constantine's Cross? Is that it? James Carroll. I think that's it, Marcy, because I remember writing it down and looking for it on Amazon. Constantine's Sword. That's what it is. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, which if you have any, I, I even if you're not a history buff, that is such a well-written book that takes all the way from the death of Jesus all the way up to Auschwitz. And it goes through this schism, this break between Christianity and Judaism, and then the, the power dynamics and the examples through the centuries of what happened. It is I think it's just it's just mandatory reading for all Christians to understand what happened. So. Available on Amazon. Constantine <laughs> Sword. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we good? You ready to dive in? Ooh. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, do you hear that dogs snoring? Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> Well, I didn't, I didn't use the ATM to start. Okay. Okay. So here we go. This is how the four gospels begin. Mark, let's get down to business. Luke, I'm going to tell you the backstory of all that led up to it. John, before I begin, let me explain why it's important to believe that Jesus is the son of God. Boy, that will be a big thing when we get to John. And then Matthew, let me give the genealogy so you know that this is about a real person, okay? Okay, chapter one and two. Chapter one and two of Matthew is going to answer these questions. Who is Jesus and where does Jesus come from? So we're going to do the genealogy and Jesus' story, and it's going to foreshadow where is Jesus going. So that's really Matthew's point with those first two chapters, um, his birth narrative is very short. So you've got two birth narratives in the four gospel, nothing in Mark, nothing in John. It's all in Matthew and Luke, right? Um, Luke is the big one, the one that has all of those rich elements that we think about with the Christmas narrative. Um, 31 verses in Matthew, 132 in Luke. So the book, big stories in Luke, Little stories in Matthew. Um, and very little about it is about Jesus. So there's no story of the journey to Bethlehem, no story of his birth, no angels singing in the sky, no shepherds, no circumcision, no temple blessing, um, no kings. Um, there are wise men that we're going to encounter that are going to bring some gifts. Um, Mary and Joseph live in Bethlehem. She gives birth at home. And Nazareth is where they go after they return from Egypt. So the focus of the first two chapters is really on Joseph and his dilemma and on Herod and his unsuccessful attempt to destroy Jesus. It's really not about Jesus. Okay, we begin with the genealogy. That's how Matthew begins his story. And it is a quite long genealogy all the way up to Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. That's how the genealogy ends. Okay, why does Matthew do this? Um, the best way to think about this is the drum roll. It's a drum roll or it's trumpets that are leading the parade in. This is the dun 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 dun. That's the genealogy, right? Um, it's arranged in six groups of seven. When we get to Revelations, we're going to talk about the numerology a bit. So seven is a powerful number, um, and the whole point of this is to signify Jesus is the fulfillment and the goal of Israel's history. Israel has had a rich history. It is all pointing to the culmination of that in Jesus, right? This is who Israel has been waiting for for 2,000 years. 
But there are some really surprising little nuggets in that list, uh, including the mother of Jesus and some other women. Tamar is in here. Rahab is in here. Ruth, Bathsheba is in here. Um, so non-Jews um, and some of the most historically misunderstood yet traditionally understood as sketchy women in the Bible. And uh, for any of you who were around when we did the women in the Bible, we did specific um, studies on all of those women. <laughs> and these are some um, historically misunderstood <laughs> sketchy women. And they are in the list that Matthew puts out there. Um, absent are the big four matriarchs. So none that we can met in Genesis, gone is Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. They are not there. Um, so Matthew seems to be saying that God works through all people and uh, watch what God is about to do. So think of the genealogy as the trumpets or the big drum roll that says everything that's happened in Israel's history is culmination is right here, right now. Okay, let's start. Let's read the birth story real quick. Will somebody read that? I will. Thanks, Chris. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Okay, so Matthews is a very um, Joseph forward story, right? So there's no Gabriel with Mary. There's no Mary and Elizabeth. There's no Magnificat. This is really Joseph's story. And um, um, <laughs> The only overlap with Luke's story is that theme of don't be afraid by the angel, right? Um, we are told who Jesus is right away. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Messiah, right? And that this is happening the first time we're going to hear it to fulfill what the Lord has said, right? So that fulfillment is going to be an incredibly powerful theme. Um now, I will say that um, we're going to talk more about this piece when we do the Mary piece and all we're going to break down the whole virgin birth component uh, when I do the all about the Mary's class during Lent. So, um, I mean, I think many of you know that piece that what he's referencing here, he's citing a piece in Isaiah, mm -hmm. um, that original piece in Isaiah actually is very time specific to uh, a, a, an event that was happening in Israel's history around the year, I think 700. Um, it's not a foreshadowing and it's, it's a poor interpretation, misinterpretation to use the word virgin. It's a, more correctly to understand it as young girl. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the Mary's class as well. Okay, next week, we're going to do chapters two and three. And two and three, let me just stop sharing for a second. Chapters two and three are going to take us in the flight to Egypt. 
um, which again, unique to Matthew. We're not going to see that anywhere else. Um, they're going to run afoul of Herod and, uh, and then they're going to come back, settle, no uh, other infancy narratives, no presentation at the temple. We're going to go right from there into his baptism. So that's what's going to happen next. Okay, questions, comments? Go ahead, Marilee. Well, I, I guess I, I see a, a um, dichotomy between the um, geology, which takes us to Joseph. And as you say, that's the story of Joseph. But then they throw in the virgin birth. And Joseph didn't have anything to do with Jesus's genealogy. So let me go back because they did not throw in the virgin birth. We threw in the virgin birth. And we're going to talk about this when I do okay. this. Okay. That makes so sense. This slide, right? Mm -hmm. This is the slide um, where it talks about it, right? So uh, but before they came together. Yeah. Yeah. The virgin will, so right here, this quote right here, this is where the basis of the virgin birth um, theologically is going to come from for centuries. What Matthew is doing, though, he is quoting Isaiah. He's quoting Isaiah. So remember Matthew, Jewish Jew, whoever Jude, mm -hmm. he's a religious scribe. He's going to talk about his scriptures. He's going to use them throughout. He's going to talk about fulfilling the scriptures. He is going to stand in the tradition of the Jewish Bible, which the, the um, book of Isaiah is critical to. And right here, he's going to kick it off by quoting Isaiah, right? So that's also how he started the gospel, right? He, so he's he's going to quote Isaiah a ton. Matthew did not create the virgin birth. Theologians after Matthew are going to read Matthew's quoting Isaiah and come up with the virgin birth. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. It's different. It's a different way to think about it. So Matthew isn't um, Matthew isn't just saying there's a virgin birth. It's gonna it's we are gonna read that into it with that one mistranslation too. It's not virgin. It's young girl. But we're oh, not that Mary Mary was with child before she met Joseph, right? Or before they came together. That's what I'm saying. That's that's what um, both Matthew that was added to the Bible after Matthew wrote it. After both, that's not in Mark. So Matthew and Luke both added this fact that Mary was pregnant when Joseph came on the scene, and we're going to talk about that in the Mary's class too. What the basis is of that one? So, yeah, but all Matthew's doing there is quoting Isaiah which he is going to throw Isaiah in all over the place. Okay, other questions, comments, reactions? I'm just getting that Matthew really was all I ever heard about coming up in Catholic schools for 14 years. It's like that. all that is so familiar to me, where yeah. Luke was like, huh? <laughs> and... <laughs> Yeah, it's um, just interesting. Yep. So for those of you who um, stand in that tradition, um, you, you're, it's going to be real challenging for you to recognize that you're going to be have to remove those lenses and read Matthew fresh. And so I'd really encourage you to practice something called close reading. Yeah. Because what what you, what it's really hard to do is once these stories are so familiar to us, yeah. right? And they've been a part of our lives for years and years and years, that it's easy to read into what we think is there uh, instead of what is there. So practice close reading when you're reading it and really hold this knowledge that Matthew is writing for a very specific community at a very specific time with very specific needs. 
So it also helps that the Isaiah class we had, right? And and the context that he was writing in. So yeah. now that I'm hearing this and and Matthew being the Jew of the Jews and the Jewish ones, of course he'd be familiar with that and pull it together. So having that other class um, helps me with this process we're going through now. Because when I read that, I thought, oh, well, of course he got it from Isaiah. Kind of yeah. sounds similar. Yeah. I, Matthew's standing on Isaiah's shoulders. Right. You know, right. We really depend on Isaiah a lot. Right. Okay. Everybody good? Bernie, you look like you have a question. Uh, no, I, I, I'm just reading again from this very, very old, old Bible. All right. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's the Holy Ghost it is, that's referred to. But here again, I'm reading that uh, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child uh, of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. So, yeah. I never, never realized that before. <laughs> Very scary as a child if it's referred to as the Holy Ghost. Terrified me. Very terrifying. <laughs> they clean that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did clean it up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll take some time. I like the way this is worded. Sometimes. I know you do, Bernie. I can't get you to move on to a new Bible. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Okay, chapters two and three, and I'll see you back here next week for, uh, we'll do it again at the same time, same place, okay? Okay, thank, thank you. you.